You know, last week we played that song and I got several texts from people. One person says, I've been so just getting cooped up, you know, anxiety being here at home and I'm so encouraged to know that someone is praying for me. And I want to remind all of you that we have a prayer line. You can join our prayer line. It's every evening of the week where you can just call in. You don't have to have a computer. You don't even have to, you know, have video or anything. Just call in a number. And that number is on our website at sfcentral.org under our calendar of events. And every evening you can call in and you can pray with others. And even if you don't call in, other people are praying for you. But I would encourage you, if you have a crisis, if you have a difficulty, if you have a need in your life, and you want other people to pray for you, you need to be praying for someone else as well. Remember, prayer and blessings need to be coming to us, but we also need to be giving those prayers and blessings out as well. Well, today our sermon is entitled, God's Treatment for Worry and Anxiety. Uh, I don't know about you, but here in the Bay Area, we've been having a lot of protests. And unfortunately, some of these protests have also attracted people that aren't there to protest. They're just there to have destruction of property. They're there to loot and also violence. I know some of our people that some of our members uh, are having a difficult time sleeping at night because they hear the gunshots, they hear the flashbang grenades, they smell the tear gas as the... Uh, uh, as the uh, uh, violent faction and the police are, are trying to uh, get control of the streets. Um, we have a person that's watching right now that in the middle of the night they had to evacuate their apartment right here in San Francisco. And before that they heard all of the glass breaking and the shouts and the, the chaos going on. And so I know it's a stressful time. I mean, when you think about it, a week ago, two weeks ago, most of us were just worried about COVID. This past week, for some of us, we weren't even thinking about COVID anymore. It was other things that were taking priority. But today I want to talk to you about what Jesus says about stress. What Jesus says that we can, how we can handle anxiety. But before we do, I'd like to have one of our young adults. We're going to have Gabriel. He is going to share with us our, our uh, scripture reading at this time. Let's go ahead and look at our screen. Happy Sabbath. My favorite verse comes from Psalms chapter 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I particularly like this verse because it tells us that God is always looking out for us like a shepherd looks out for his sheep and he's going to take care of us always. Thank you. Don't you like that? Jesus is our shepherd. He's looking out for us. We're his sheep. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And I'm so glad that uh, our young person shared that with us today because that's something we need to remember as we're talking about anxiety, as we're talking about worry, that you and I have a loving Heavenly Father and he says, I'm like a shepherd and I'm looking out for you. I'm going to take care of you. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to see what God's treatment for worry and anxiety is. We are going to look at some Bible verses. We will put the verses up on the screen. Uh, but we're also going to be actually looking at them in Scripture. So you need to grab your Bible because we're not going to have all the verses up on the screen for you. But I just want to talk to you uh, about worry. And I came across an interesting quote. Here's the quote. It says, what worries you masters you. And I would like you to have one master, and that master is Jesus Christ. And if worry is your master, it's going to cause health problems. It's going to cause stress effects in your life. Never forget, what worries you masters you. And I think that's why Jesus spoke a lot about worry. In fact, whenever we look at the uh, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is uh, listed there in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is no commonly referred to in theological circles as the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes. Three chapters where Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, it says he went up onto a mountain, gathered the people around, and then he began to teach them. And he taught them for the next three chapters. We call this the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, if we were to take a close look at this 
uh, the, the, the words in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we find something interesting. And we'll put that up here on the screen here for you. And this is just something I did in my Bible study this past week, is what I did was I categorized the Sermon in the, on the Mount into the different categories, so to speak, the Beatitudes, the, where Jesus talked about salt and light, talked about fulfilling the law. Jesus had some specific instructions about murder, about adultery, about divorce, oaths, revenge, charity, prayer, fasting, love of money, worry, judging, asking and receiving, choices, fruit, by their fruit you will know them, and then the wise and foolish builders. So if you take the Sermon on the Mount, you will find that there's these little categories. And when you look at these little categories, what you do is you see how many words are in each of the categories is what I did. And you'll see that right here on your screen where I have the circle around it. So right here, you'll find all these stories and you find Matthew 5, 6, and 7 with the stories and the number of words, okay? So right here, we have Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. Now, something is interesting that popped out to me when I was doing my research this past week, and that is when you look at Matthew chapter 6, you will find that the second highest number of words that Jesus dedicated to a subject in his Sermon on the Mount, it has to do with the subject of prayer. So when you look at all of the topics that Jesus talked about on the Sermon on the Mount, the one that received the second highest number of words. So we would say the one that received the second highest amount of time was the subject of prayer. And I think prayer is so important in our lives, especially as we're going through difficult times. But the topic that received the most amount of words, the most amount of words as compared to any of the other topics, we, almost 250 words, is the topic of worry. When you look at the Beatitudes and you see how much time Jesus, had to, Jesus devoted to each of the topics, the topic of worry received the most amount of words. Now, I know this sounds very technical, but when you look at that, this gives us a indication of how important it is for Jesus. Now, I'm not saying some of these are not important and some of them all are important. All of them are important if Jesus talks to us about them. But Jesus talked more about our need to not worry than he talked about, let's say, murder or lust or even adultery. When you look at this, what it does is it tells us that worrying and anxiety in our life is very important to God so important that Jesus spent the most amount of time in the Sermon on the Mount talking about this. Now, I don't know about you. Perhaps you don't have a care in the world. Perhaps you don't worry about anything. I have a lot of worries. And I know there's a, some of you that have a lot of worries. So I just want to let you know that Jesus is so, uh, he sees this as such a priority to help you to stop worrying that he gave you more instructions about worrying than he even gave you about blessed are the whoever or the salt and the light, or fulfilling the law, he talked about worrying. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And if any of you would like this chart, go ahead and email me at adventistpastor at gmail.com. And I can forward this to you as kind of a fascinating study I did this past week. But when we look at the topic of worry and anxiety, <clears throat> this is something that I believe is part of all of our lives. It's part of your life if you're a Christian. It's part of your life if you're not a Christian. And Jesus gave some very practical instructions about this. So what I'd like to do is we're today going to look at God's treatment, how God tells us how to handle the worry and anxiety in our lives. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Now, we're not going to put these words up on the screen, so you're going to have to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to be right in the very middle of the, right in the very middle of the Beatitudes, right in the very middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting because when you uh, look at our graph again, you will see that almost in the very middle 
of the Sermon on the Mount is where you find this uh, emphasis on prayer and not worry, which according to uh, the theologians, kind of gives us a chiasmic structure, which is the way the Hebrew people, they wouldn't put the most important thing at the end or the most important thing in the, uh, at the beginning. They would put the most important topic in the middle. And that's what you'll see here Jesus does in his Sermon on the Mount. His most important topic here is prayer and not to worry or not to have anxiety. So Matthew chapter six and verse 25, and I'm hoping that our lecture today will be very practical. I don't want it just to be like, oh, don't worry, worry is bad, don't worry. And we walk away and we worry because we have so much worry and we're worried because we're not supposed to have worry and so we're kind of worried that God doesn't want us to have worry. No, I want us to see practically what can I do to decrease the worry in my life. Matthew chapter six and verse 25. Matthew chapter six and verse 25. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, do not worry. Therefore I say to you, do not worry. If we were to summarize this whole passage, it would be summarized in this sentence right here, do not worry. Now, if Jesus were to say to us, do not commit adultery, if Jesus were to say to us, do not steal, if Jesus were to say to us, do not kill, we would say, this is a commandment, we're not supposed to do it. But if I were to say to you right now, Jesus says to you, do not worry, and you're like, yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah, I know I shouldn't be worrying. We've taken this commandment and we've moved it from a command to a wish. And we're like, yeah, I know God doesn't want me to do that. Friends, we need to see when Jesus says, therefore I say to you, this is an emphatic statement in the Greek. Therefore I'm telling you, do not worry. Look what he says here in verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So here what Jesus does is he says, don't worry, and he tells us two things not to worry about. He says, do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. So essentially, we could kind of summarize this, and Jesus is covering the whole gamut of what we worry about. On one side, we worry about food. Now, food is very important. Uh, if you don't have food, then you're going to starve to death, and before you starve to death, you're gonna lose a lot of weight, and most likely, you're gonna get sick. So what we see here is Jesus uses food on one side, and then he talks about clothing on the other side. Now, clothing is not really a really big necessity, you could say. Now, some of you are like, oh, yes, I want to be clothed. And we're not talking about the difference between clothing and nakedness. We're talking about Jesus says, don't worry about what you wear. Uh, essentially, should I wear this or should I wear that? Or am I keeping up with what everybody else wants me to wear? Today, clothing is very important for especially young people seeing your identity. In ancient times, clothing was extremely important because when you go out, you have to uh, come up to a certain standard, so to speak, and, and socially, you have to be at this level, so that means you have to dress the part. So when we look here, Jesus says, don't worry, and he, he runs the gamut. On this side, we have all of the very important stuff, the priorities, and on this side, the stuff that isn't as important. And Jesus says, you shouldn't worry about any of it. Now, if I were right now were to tell you, you know what, you shouldn't worry about uh, what color of shoes you're wearing. You would say, that's a little thing. But if I say, it's important for you to worry about your health care, it's important for you to worry about finances, it's important for you to worry about food, then you would say, okay, so Mark is essentially telling me, don't worry about the little stuff, but I need to worry about the big stuff. But here what Jesus is saying is, don't worry about the little stuff, but also don't worry about the big stuff. And this is something that we need to remember. When Jesus says, don't worry, he is telling us, don't worry about anything. We don't have to sit there and prioritize and say, well, this is important to me, therefore I'm gonna worry about it. No, Jesus says, don't worry about little stuff, don't worry about big stuff. Notice what he says here. In Luke chapter 10, <clears throat> In Luke chapter 10, and you don't have to go there for, with me for, for uh, we're actually going to put the words up on the screen. Just stay in Matthew chapter uh, 6 for a moment. But in Luke chapter 10, if you remember the story, Jesus has just climbed up the long road from Jericho. He's coming up to Jerusalem, and he's stopping by a little house in Bethany. As he comes to the little house in Bethany, there's no way for him to call in. There's no way for him to, you know, announce his coming before he gets there. And so he comes up, and I'm just imagining, he goes up to a little t uh, house there in the little village of Bethany and he knocks on the door and Mary 
and Martha and Lazarus, they're so glad that he's there. And so they invite him in and Jesus sits down. It's a long hike all the way up from Jericho. Martha is there and Martha is like, wow, I haven't seen Jesus in a long time. Can you tell me about the kingdom of God, Jesus? And so Jesus begins to talk to Mary and Martha is there and Martha is so excited that Jesus is there. So she begins to, to fix a meal and she's kind of looking over and, and she has a lot of work to do and she's getting really kind of upset that her sister isn't helping her. And so what Martha does is she walks into the room where Jesus is and she says to Jesus, don't you care that my sister isn't helping me? Come on, essentially, it's your fault. Can you please tell her to... To work and can you just be quiet and tell her to come in here and help me and look what Jesus says to her Martha Martha the Lord answered you are worried and upset about many things but only one thing is needed Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her now it almost sounds like Jesus is being a little bit hard on Martha but whenever you see in the Bible that a person is named uh, their name is used twice in a row it is a sign of endearment so essentially, with Jesus saying, Martha, Martha, that would be like him saying, dear Martha, or my good friend Martha. He's not being hard on Martha, but he's trying to help her to realize that she has a problem, and her problem is with worry. Look what he says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. You see, worry can affect our spiritual life as well as our physical life. Here he says, Mary, I mean, sorry, Martha, you're worried about a lot of things, but only one thing is necessary. I mean, think about this for just a minute. Martha is so upset about her sister not helping her in the kitchen that she is ready to be rude to her guest of honor. And isn't that the way it is in our lives sometimes? When we're worried about something, we frequently are rude or unkind to our spouses, we're rude or unkind to our loved ones, our children, our parents. And what's more important? I think what's more important is not worrying. Because when you don't worry, there's a lot of things that are going to happen, including you're not going to be rude to your loved ones. You know, when you look here at our uh, our topic of worrying about important things. It's not just about the food. It's not just about physical things. It's also about spiritual things as well. Now take a look here at your screen, okay? Jesus says, uh, actually look in your Bible, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, this is such a powerful sentence. If I could have all of you memorize this, if you can memorize this, if you and I can just grasp this as a small amount of understanding, I think this is going to really help us with our worry. Because here Jesus says, don't worry about, what does he say? Don't worry about food, don't worry about clothes. And then he goes on and he says, is not life more important than food? and the body more important than clothes. Essentially, what Jesus here is saying, now listen closely, what Jesus here is saying is, when you and I are worried about clothing, it can hurt our bodies. When you and I are worried about food, it can actually hurt our very life. Think about this for just a moment. Whenever you're worried about something, it can physically hurt you. And Jesus says, your life, your body is more important than what you're worried about. Let me just uh, illustrate this for you for just a moment. When you are worried, when you have anxiety, it actually affects your body. You can't just say, oh, I'm worried about something, but it's not hurting anything. No. Worry causes stress. Worry causes a physical response in your body. And on your screen right now, you see a list of just a few of the many symptoms that can happen in our bodies as a result of worry. So what Jesus here is saying when he says, is not your life more important than food? Is not your body more important than the clothes that you're wearing? What he's saying is when you worry about the little things, it's going to affect your body. And Jesus wants us to be healthy. 
Let's just talk about that line for just a moment. Is not your body more important than food? You know, I know of some people and they want to eat healthy. They want to eat healthy so that their body stays healthy. And that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to eat everything that we see out there. He doesn't want us to eat unhealthfully. He doesn't want us to eat an excess of sweets and an excess of sugar and an excess of, of carbohydrates and an excess of fatty materials. This is not good for our body. So he wants us to eat healthfully. But the problem is, is if Satan, Satan does not want us to be um, uh, uh, rational. He wants us to go to extremes. And a lot of times what people do is they take these ideas to extremes. And there's people sometimes, very frequently, and they will take their diet, they will take their food, and they will be so obsessed and worried about their food that it's affecting their body. And this is why Jesus says, is not your body more important than food? Now, yes, we're supposed to eat healthfully, but if you're so focused on food, if you're so focused and worried about your food and about all the additives in their food and everything that's happening out there that you have no control over, and if it's affecting you physically, then you need to hear what Jesus is saying right now. He says, is not your body more important than food? Don't worry about your food. Now, I know we're talking about extremes here. But there are some people that take this to such an extreme that it actually affects their very life. People can have chronic headaches. People can have uh, other ailments that happen in their body as a result of stress, as a result of anxiety, as a result of, as a result of worry. And that's why what we find here when Jesus says, is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? If you're worried about clothing and you're worried about food and it's affecting your body and it's affecting your life, it's important for us to listen to what Jesus is saying here. Because he wants us to eat healthfully so that we can enjoy good health. But if you're so obsessed about your food, if you're so obsessed about your clothing, if you're so obsessed about other stuff, it's affecting the important stuff, then it's a time for us to listen to Jesus when he says, do not worry. Do not worry. You know, it's one thing for us to eat healthfully. It's another thing for us to worry about our food. And of course, we get them mixed up sometimes and we're like, oh, I'm so worried about this or I'm so worried about that. We need to separate it. And we say, I want to eat healthfully, but I'm not going to worry anymore. You know, there's a really good chapter in a book called Ministry of Healing. This chapter in the book Ministry of Healing is called Mind Cure. And I just love this chapter. If any of you would like a uh, a link to be able to read this chapter. I think all of you should read it. I try to read it at least twice a year myself. But in this chapter, it says that the majority of illnesses are caused by your imagination. And if you go and talk to a doctor, if you go and talk to many of the healthcare providers, they will tell you that there's a lot of illnesses that have real causes, but there's also a lot of illnesses that have causes that start from the brain either a, 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 uh, a certain thought process or a way of looking at things that is not healthy that leads to unhealthy habits. But it's important to remember that Jesus here says, hey, let's talk about your brain. Don't worry. Look what he says here on our uh, sheet of paper. I'm sorry, on the screen. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Life and body. Stop worrying about the other stuff that affects your life and your body. Now, when we look at this, we're not just talking about the physical life. We're talking about the spiritual life as well. We're not just talking about worrying uh, gives you headaches. Worrying can give you a rash. Worrying can, pre can precipitate arthritis. Worrying can do so much stuff like this. It's not just physical. It's also spiritual. Worrying can affect your spiritual life. Do you remember the story of the sower? You remember how the sower went out and he planted seeds and some fell on stony ground and some fell on a hard path and some fell amongst the thistles and thorns and some fell on good soil? And that represents the word of God falling on our hearts. Well, look what Jesus said about the, uh, the, 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 the seed that fell on the thorny ground. Look what he says. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns 
is the man who hears the word, but the, let's say that all the, let's say that word together, okay? But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. You see, worry doesn't just affect our physical bodies. Worry can affect our spiritual life as well. Here, Jesus talks about a person who receives the word. The word is growing in their life. And then it's like the thorns and the thistle, thistles come and just choke it out. Whenever I think of this verse that you have on your screen, I think of whenever we visited our friends up in Oregon and Washington, because you go up there and boy, there's just these piles of blackberry bushes along the sides of the highways. I mean, there's nothing else that can grow there because this stuff just chokes it out. I mean, it might be like six or eight feet tall. And I mean, there might have been like a garden there at one time or there might have been some flowers, but man, the, the thorns just take over. And here Jesus says, you can be studying the word, you can be following what the word says, but then worry can come into your life and worry can just come and just choke it all out. So what does Jesus say? Do not worry. But you might say to yourself, but I can't stop worrying. I mean, that would be like me telling you right now to stop thinking about the color blue. Don't think about the color blue. It's not good to think about the color blue. Every time I say the color blue, you're going to be thinking about the color blue. And so a lot of times we say, don't worry. Now we're worried because we're worrying. And we're like, you need to stop worrying. But I can't stop worrying because I'm worried because you told me to stop worrying. I mean, I'm worried because Jesus said to stop worrying. Here, how do we stop worrying? Look what Jesus says now, okay? He starts out and he says, don't worry about the whole gamut of stuff from food all the way over to what you wear. And then he says, listen, isn't your life more important than food? Isn't your body more important than clothing? But how can I stop worrying? Look what he says now in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So think about this for just a moment. Jesus just said, stop worrying. And then he says, I want you to consider the birds of the air or behold the birds of the air. I want you to think about the word, it comes from the King James, behold the birds. Another word for behold is to look at. Actually, let's look at the Greek word for behold. The Greek word for behold is to look at, to consider, to think about, to focus on. So right now, if you are struggling with worry, I want you to start thinking about the birds. That's essentially what Jesus says. Think about the birds. Now, not just think about the birds. He says, I want you to behold the birds. The word behold means to look at. Now, I don't care if you live in the country or if you live in the city, you can always look at birds. You can maybe pick up a hobby. You know, if you're finding yourself worrying about worry right now, if you find yourself with a lot of worry in your life, I'd like to encourage you to start a new hobby and this new hobby is bird watching. This isn't just my idea, this is Jesus's idea. He says, behold the birds. Now there's two ways that you can look at the birds. One is, is you could go out and you could become a bird watcher. All you need to have, become a bird watcher is a pair of binoculars and a little book and you can go around and start identifying birds. No matter where you live right now, you can do a Google search. If you're here in San Francisco, do a Google search for San Francisco bird watching. And you will find that there's clubs here in San Francisco. And yes, they might not be meeting right now, but they have these online discussions of, I saw this bird, and I saw that bird, and I saw this bird. And they say that right here in San Francisco, we have some of the best bird watching locations of all of California. You don't have to get in the car and drive anybody anywhere. You can just go out and you can be looking at the birds and you can be counting the birds. And the fascinating thing is, is the birds migrate and they come by at certain times of the year as they head south and at certain times of the year as they head north. And you can be looking at these birds. And as you're looking at these birds, Jesus says, just consider, just think about what's going on with these birds. They're not worried. Their heavenly father is looking out for them. Now, perhaps you're like, oh, I can't get out. I can't be a bird watcher. Well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can go get yourself a bird feeder and you can be looking at birds every single day outside your window. You can get a bird feeder with seeds in it and that'll attract the seed eating birds. You can get a bird feeder with, with some honey water, in, sorry, sugar water in it. You can attract the hummingbirds. But here Jesus says, if you're struggling with worrying, go look at the birds. And I would just like to encourage you 
to take what Jesus says seriously. Remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives more words dedicated to worrying and not worrying to any other topic. And he doesn't just say, don't worry. He tells us and he gives us uh, antidotes. He gives us uh, practical ways that we can stop worrying. The first way to stop worrying is he says, look at the birds. Look at the birds. I want to encourage you to go out in nature and look at the birds. Look what Jesus says in verse 26. We're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow or reap or gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I mean, who is the one that put into the little hummingbirds' brains the idea of being able to travel hundreds and thousands of miles as they migrate all the way down to Mexico every single winter and then come all the way back across the United States and all the way up into the Rockies and all the way up into Canada in the summer? Who is the one that trained them how to do that? It's God, and yet he loves you more than he loves those birds. Jesus goes on here and he says, verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now, you might have another translation, and it might say, which of you by worrying can add one hour to your life? If you closely look at the commentary and look at the Greek words, with these words can be translated either way. But essentially, Jesus says, worrying does not accomplish anything. Jesus is essentially telling us, worrying is not productive. In fact, he just made the point that worrying can actually hurt the more important parts of your life. If you're worried about your looks and it's causing you to have pain, then you need to stop worrying about your looks because your looks are not as important as living a pain-free existence. If you're worried about your food and the worrying about your food is causing you to have other illnesses, then you need to stop the worrying. And Jesus says, you know what? Let me just tell you something. Worrying is not productive at all. So you might say, yeah, worrying might hurt me, but it still is good. No, Jesus says, worrying doesn't produce anything. He says, which of you by worrying can add an hour to your life or add an inch to your uh, stature? It's not going to work. It's not productive. So don't worry. How do we not worry? Well, number one, we look at the birds. Number two, look what he says. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Now you might say, I don't worry about clothing. Jesus is using clothing here as an example of worrying about something that's not that important. Yes, worrying about food, that might be a little bit more important, but worrying about clothing? He says, that's not important. It's not important how you look. It's not important your status. Now I just want to tell you one of my pet peeves, and this is my pet peeve. So many times we complain about something that God has given us. Now look at my face. Oh, I guess you already are. I got one of the longest nose in the world. It's just from my genetics. I got the German genes. And I'll tell you what, I got a long nose. When I was a little boy, I was so embarrassed about my nose, people would make fun of my nose. I've had people tell me, don't turn your head quickly, Mark, to the left or to the right, because it could cause a cyclone somewhere in the world, because that's like a wind sail, whipping around like that. I was embarrassed about my nose. And my ears, there was this man one time, and he loved to tell everybody, hey, Mark, turn around. And I would turn around, and he says, doesn't it look like a Volkswagen with the doors open? I mean, he would always make fun of my ears. My ears stuck out of the sides of my head. I guess it's because I'm kind of skinny and I had a short haircut. My ears would always stick out. So I have big ears and I have a big nose. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that God is the one that gave me this nose. He's the one that gave me this ear, these ears. I'm so thankful for them. What are you griping about? What are you complaining about that God has given you? Do you think that makes God feel good? Now, yes, there's some things that we could improve on. So there's some things that maybe are a result of us eating a little bit too much food or not exercising enough or something like that. But I'll tell you what, friends, when you and I complain about the way we look, I think it really hurts God's feelings. Look what Jesus here says in verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Why do you worry about the way you look? Verse 28, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they, they, they neither toil or spin. So here Jesus is talking about those little things. And he says, why do you worry about your clothes? Why do you worry about the way you look? Consider the lilies of the fields. I want you to think about that word for just a moment. Consider the lilies. Now, Jesus here wasn't specifically talking about lilies. When you look at the Greek word that is used here, it's not the Greek word for lilies. It's the Greek word for wildflowers. So here Jesus is saying, listen, 
Don't just go down and look at the roses that are in someone's rose garden or look at their, you know, uh, beautiful uh, flowers that they've planted and are growing. No, Jesus here is saying, I want you to think about the flowers that are just growing out on the hillsides, the flowers that are just growing on their own. Consider the wildflowers. You know, one of the things that my wife and I love to do is go and look at the wildflowers in the spring. Uh, some of the hills you'll go to, particularly down near San Luis Obispo or up in the Tehachapi Wilderness over near Bakersfield. I mean, just, just do a Google search of Tehachapi wildflowers or Bakersfield wildflowers. I mean, the hills are just covered with wildflowers. And Jesus says, take a look at those wildflowers. I want you to stop and think about it. In fact, Jesus here uses the word consider. Consider the flowers. Now, we looked at the word earlier, behold the birds. Behold the birds is essentially look at, think about it, think about these birds. Now he says, consider the wildflowers. Now this word consider is used only once in all of the New Testament, and this is the place that it is used. And this word consider literally means to learn thoroughly, examine carefully, and examine and learn. So I know this sounds very basic, but if Jesus says to you today, don't worry, and if you say, I can't stop worrying, Jesus says back to you two things. Number one, behold the birds. Number two, consider the flowers. Consider the flowers. Essentially what Jesus wants us to do is he wants us to start looking at the things in nature. And all of us can consider the flowers. All of us can consider and we can grow flowers. I love flowers. My wife and I have uh, a lot of flowers around our house. And uh, you might say it's a lot of work. Why do you do that? Because when I get out in the flowers and I start thinking about, uh, you know, how to grow a flower and I just say to myself, God, I'm your little flower and I want the rain of your Holy Spirit to fall on me. And then as the weeds start growing, we have to pull the weeds out. And I say, dear God, help me to get the weeds, these obnoxious things, these bad habits out of my life. Help me to get the sin out of my life. And then as the flowers come and I smell the flowers and I'm like, wow, this smells so good. And I grab the flower and I run in and I show it to Pat and we smell the flower. And I think to myself, when other people are around me, are they like, boy, Mark smells good as in Mark is a nice guy or is it like, whoo, Mark stinks. Mark is not a nice guy at all. I mean, we can learn a lot from the flowers and that's why Jesus says, consider the flowers. But even more than that, we need to be thinking about the flowers. We need to be looking at the flowers to realize that flowers don't worry. Flowers don't sit there and say, oh, I'm only a red rose and I wish I could look like the, blue, uh, the yellow rose over there. And the yellow rose is like, but I don't have as many flowers on mine. Flowers don't worry. And maybe where you're living right now, you don't have access to a lot of flowers. Maybe you can't have a nice flower garden. Well, friends, you can go down and you can get just one flower pot and you can get that flower pot and you can grow a flower in your house. And you might say, you know what? I kill all the flowers. I don't water them. I forget to water them. Okay, then go get yourself a cactus. Get yourself a cactus because even cactuses have flowers. I want to show you some pictures from my friend Nicole. Nicole lives there in Menlo Park, and she sent me this picture the other day. Look at that beautiful flower on her cactus. That was one of the most beautiful pictures I've seen of a flower, and it's coming from a cactus. So if you would like a, a flower that you don't have to water a lot, then maybe get yourself a cactus. Here are some of her other cactus flowers. And if you go to her house, you will find that there's all these flowers around her house. And when you go and hang out with Nicole, you're gonna find that Nicole is happy and cheerful. Why? Because she's following what God says. He says, consider the flowers. Spend some time looking at the flowers. Moving on, Matthew 6 and verse 33. Actually, we'll finish reading verse uh, 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, ne they neither toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the flowers of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, oh, ye of little, f oh, how much, let me back up. Which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. 
for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Essentially, Jesus says all of the world is worrying right now. Everybody else is worrying. But you, as a Christian, I'm asking you to rise above that and not be like all the other worldlings, all the other Gentiles, all the other people that don't believe in me. You're a Christian, and I'm asking you, don't worry. I'll take care of your worrying for you. Now, look what Jesus says, Matthew 6, 33. We've seen this before. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So here Jesus says, while everybody else is worrying, while everybody else is running around and saying, what shall we eat or what shall we wear or what shall we drink? And they're worried about all this stuff. Jesus says, you are going to be different and I'm giving you something to do. I want you, while all of these people are running around worrying, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. You know, the thing that I like about the Matthew 6, 33 is that Jesus essentially is saying, your job is to seek me first. My job is is to take care of your needs. You see, a lot of times we get these roles mixed up and we think our job is to worry about what we eat and wear and what we're gonna do and our jobs and everything else. And Jesus here is saying, no, 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 no. Your job is to seek me first. My job is to take care of all this. Have you ever had somebody that doesn't do their job and they try to do your job? You know, in the helicopter, uh, sometimes when you work with some of the newer flight nurses, it can be kind of frustrating because they don't know exactly what they're supposed to do. And when you arrive on the scene of an accident, we have very specific roles. One of the nurses is gonna go over and assess the patient. The other nurse is going to be connecting the patient to the monitors, starting IVs, giving medications. And so if, if the nurse that is supposed to be getting report goes over and starts starting an IV, then if I'm there and I was supposed to start the IV, I'm like, wait a minute, that was my job. And I can just imagine God is doing the same thing with us where he's like, okay, your job is to seek the kingdom of God first. And my job is to take care of your clothing and your food and your body and your health and your wealth. And then God is like, but wait a minute, here's Mark. And all he does is worry about this other stuff. He's worrying about my job. So friends, never forget Matthew 6, It's in the context of don't worry. And here's one of the secrets of not worrying. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You know, this past week, I was talking to one of our young people that is here in San Francisco and they were uh, getting stressed about the sound of looters getting closer and closer to their house. And I told them, I said, okay, I want you to go read Psalms 91. What I was really telling them is I want you to follow Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And as they read Psalms 91, they felt at peace. As they read Psalms 91, they could sense that God was gonna protect them and God did protect them and keep them safe. So no matter what you're going through right now, I want to encourage you, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that you're worried about are gonna take care of themselves. If you find yourself having health problems, if you find yourself starting to have physical signs of stress and anxiety in your life, if you're starting to have some of those signs we saw earlier as a result of your worrying, you need to start seeking God, putting him first in your life. And purposely, every time you start thinking about your problems or worrying about it, you have to say, nope, I'm going to let God take care of that. That's his job. I do my job and God will do his job. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. Matthew 6 and verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, I was really reminded of that, of this, this past two weeks. I've been worried. I'll admit, I worry. I've been worried about COVID. I've been concerned about, you know, what's going to happen. How are we going to reopen the church? When are we going to reopen the church? I've been worried about my parents. They're elderly. I want them to stay healthy. I've been worried about my friends. I've been worried about my friends who've lost loved ones as a result of COVID. But you know what? A week and a half ago, we had a very vicious thing happened here in the United States of America where a person lost his life. And as a result of that, there was protests. And I think it's a good thing for us to protest. 
But then along came the protests, came the people that were looting, the people that were causing violence. And you know what? I stopped worrying about the COVID and now I have something else to worry about. And here Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 34, he says, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient to the day is its own trouble. Essentially what Jesus here is saying is, I'm telling you not to worry. He's not taking away the stuff that causes us to worry. No, he says it's always going to be there. And if right now you're so worried about one thing, let me tell you something. Tomorrow it'll be something else. And the next day it'll be something else. I mean, I just have to be honest with you folks. What we're seeing happening right now with some of these protests, what we're seeing happening right now with some of the violence and some of the riots, I think is only going to get worse. I think what's going to happen in the fall, particularly after the political climate here we have in the United States, I think potentially we could have much worse violence, much worse riots, much worse uh, protests. So if we can't learn to stop worrying about what's happening right now, how are we going to not worry about it then whenever it happens? And then they tell us that potentially we're going to have a, another wave of this COVID. I think there's a good chance we're going to have another wave of COVID, especially when you see people going out and they're not wearing their masks, they're not doing social distancing, and they're saying, oh, I don't really care about that anymore. So let's just say right now that we have, you know, 800, 900, 1200, 1500 people. I mean, at the max, we were having 2,800 people die per day here in the United States of COVID. Let's say in the fall, that goes to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And if we can't learn to trust in God now, what are we gonna do when it gets worse? You see, a lot of times we think, oh, this is really bad now, but it's gonna get better. No, what the Bible tells us is this is really bad now, and it's only gonna get worse. So we have a choice. We either stop worrying now, we either learn how to control our worry now, or we're just gonna worry ourselves sick. That's why Jesus here says, verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. Friends, there's a lot of storms ahead. There's a lot of issues ahead, but never forget that Jesus has given us a recipe to stop our worrying. I just want you to look at this picture that we put up on the screen for you. This is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. You know, we have pictures of Jesus, you know, giving people a hug or being with them. But the reason I love this picture is because each one of us has a life that's represented by this sailboat. Each one of us in our life, we are at the, the tiller. We are there at the steering wheel, so to speak. And our goal is to make it home. Our goal is to make it home without a shipwreck on the rocks. And when you look at this, Look at this picture closely because you'll see there's a lighthouse just over to the right. And this lighthouse over to the right represents God's word. The lighthouse over to, to the right represents the warnings. It represents the encouragement we receive from God's word. But right beside us, Jesus is there beside us. And he's going through the storm beside us. And if you're going through a crisis right now, never forget that Jesus will be right beside you during this crisis. And tomorrow, when the crisis gets worse, Jesus is going to be right beside you in the crisis tomorrow. And in three months, when the crisis is way worse than it is today, Jesus is also going to be with you as well. So friends, let's start practicing today not to worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow is going to have a lot of problems of its own. And one thing tomorrow doesn't need is us worrying. I'd like to just do a quick review. Number four, we learned, seek his kingdom. Now, I just want to talk to you about practical things, what to do, how to stop worrying, okay? Number four, seek his kingdom. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Number three, consider the flowers. I want you, when you start worrying, to go and look at the flowers. I want you to think about the flowers. I want you to look at the flowers. I want you to say, what can God tell me about these flowers? Number two, what did we learn? Behold the birds, okay? Between the birds and the flowers, I think we have some things to distract our minds off of the things we worry about. And then number one, do not worry. How do we not worry? Well, we behold the birds, we consider the flowers, and we seek first his kingdom.
I want to share with you a quote. This comes from Desire of Ages, page 330. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. So the moment you tell me I'm worried about this, what I would say is, is you've taken God out of the picture. You've taken Jesus out of the picture, and without Jesus, you don't know what the future holds. So if you're worried about your looks, if you're worried about your health, if, you've, if you're worried about your food, if, you've, if you're worried about the economy, if you're worried about whatever you're worried about, worry is blind and cannot discern the future. What is the future? Our future is Jesus Christ. Our future is God taking care of us. So let's go back to our quote. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But God, sorry, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, let's say that all together, in every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. So in every difficulty, he already has a way to bring relief. In every difficulty, while you're worrying and you're making more problems, he already had a solution to the original problem already set up. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Now you might say, you know what, I am so worried. I don't see any way out of this difficulty that I am. I don't see, there's no solution. For every time you say there's no solution, our Heavenly Father has a thousand solutions for your problem, okay? So why are you worried about it? You don't know those thousands, but he knows what the thousand is. Let's say this all together. The words are up on your screen. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle, not 10 principles, not five principles, but the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Doesn't that sound like another way of saying Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Back to our quote, those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish in a plain path before their feet. In a plain path before their feet. Friends, as we close today, I just want to encourage you to remember that if you worry, you're like all the rest of us, you're human. But Jesus wants to give us victory over our worry. Jesus wants to give us power and strength to stop worrying because worry is not good for you. You will never go to a doctor and a doctor says, we found scientific evidence that establishes the fact that worry is good for you. No, worry is not good good for you. Jesus knew that. 2,000 years ago, the Bible knew this, and that's why Jesus devoted more words in the Sermon on the Mount to stop worrying than any other topic. So I want to encourage you. Number one, do not worry. Number two, if you find yourself worrying, go out and behold the birds. Look at the birds. Consider the birds. Number three, Get yourself a little plant. Get yourself a flower. And when you start worrying, go over that flower. Don't talk to the flower, but talk to God and say, God, what are some of the lessons you want me to learn from this flower? Because Jesus says, whenever you're worrying, go consider the flowers and stop your worrying. And number four, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, friends, when you look at some of the great missionaries of the past. When you look at some of these mighty workers for God, their face might be wrinkled. Their hair might be gray. They might be stooped over. They might not have the best looks, but they have a faith in Jesus Christ that has changed other people's lives. And when you look at your life right now, when you consider what you're worrying about, you're not doing anybody else any good and you're not helping the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, don't worry about your looks. Don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about any of these things. Because he says, you know what? There's going to be problems, but I'll take care of you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God in heaven, we want to thank you for giving us these promises of hope in Matthew chapter 6. And I pray for the people that are worrying right now. I pray that you would help us to find practical ways, as Jesus pointed out here, to stop our worrying. Help us to start looking at this as a command, not a request. Help us to look at this as a command and not a wish. 
and help us to put these things into our life. God, please forgive us for all the times when we've been worrying. Forgive us for all the times when we have been anxious about things. And you're just up there saying, please stop worrying. You do your job, I'll do my job. And God, we thank you for the promise of salvation. I pray for a blessing on each person that's listening right now. In Jesus' name, amen.